Hello and welcome to part 2 of my 286 from Heaven or Hell series where we will be transforming this into this. So, if you're into exploding capacitors, black and white bio screens, old MFM hard drives, some hardware debugging, fixing hardware, or retro computing in general, you've come to the right place. So we're back here with the power supply. And notice anything different? Yeah, all the caps have been soldered back on. Because as I read in a lot of the comments, and as I already found out shortly after creating the first video, this power supply needs a specific load in order to turn on. So the behavior that you're seeing here, where the fan briefly starts and then starts spinning when you turn off the power supply, is because of the load sensor in the power supply it doesn't detect any load. So, in order for this to start, we need to put some load on it, and a hard drive should be sufficient. So, as I'm turning on the power supply now, you can see the fan is constantly spinning, which is a good thing. So, to ensure that the correct voltages are being outputted, it's always handy to have your multimeter at hand. So, I'm just going to be checking the 5 and the 12 volt rails of this power supply. And we get a clean 5.1 volts here and a 12.01 volts here which is excellent now sometimes a single hard drive isn't sufficient and if your power supply needs a lot more load you can always try to put one of these old mfm hard drives onto it if you have one so time to put the original power supply back into the case so we'll just route the power connector back to the front here so let's switch on the machine to see if it actually works now I don't have anything attached to it except for the video card. So as soon as I start it up we see the 286 BIOS boot screen, we see the memory count counting upwards to 1 megabyte. We obviously get a CMOS system options error so we're just going to be uh, running some diagnostics here because the BIOS ROM has this diagnostics utility here allowing you to test the keyboard, but also other functions like the video card where it will display different types of graphics modes, text, different resolutions. And you can also test the printer and the communication uh, ports. Now there is no I.O. port installed in this thing so there's no point in testing but we'll do that later on. For now let's start by adding some peripherals and we'll start with this MFM controller card because this MFM controller card not only allows you to attach two hard drives it also allows you to attach the floppy drives. Now this machine has two floppy drives so we'll use this standard floppy drive cable to attach our disk drives. On this machine we have two, we have a three and a half inch and a five and a quarter inch floppy drive. So this is a five and a quarter inch one. So this is a 1.2 megabyte uh, floppy drive from 1990. So this should accept both 1.2 megabyte and 360 kilobyte floppies. So now before I put this in use, I will be cleaning the heads as I have gone the trouble of removing the floppy drive out of its case. So now is as good a time as any to uh, to clean up those heads just to make sure that the disks will be read properly. So in order to do that we just lift the head assembly here and use some isopropyl alcohol to clean the heads both on the bottom and on the top. Now all we need to do is attach our floppy drive cable. So we'll start with the three and a half inch disk drive and the five and a quarter inch one is configured to be used as the second disk drive. As there are jumpers on the PCB of this floppy drive that configure it to be used as the second one. We'll also need to provide power obviously to both of the drives and then we can attach the floppy drive cable on the MFM controller card into the designated area here. Now once that has been done we can add the MFM controller card onto the main board, boot up the PC and see if it will accept our disks. Now the first thing you notice when we start the PC is that the LEDs of the two drives lit up. So this is a cabling issue. Sometimes it's not that straightforward to see how exactly the floppy drive ribbon cable should be inserted into the disk drive. But the LEDs being on constantly is a dead giveaway. So this is how it should normally boot. You should see and hear both drives initializing themselves doing a seek test. 
and of course we need to configure them in the computer CMOS so we'll set the 1.4 three and a half inch as floppy drive A and the 1.2 megabyte five and a quarter inch and in floppy drive B and let's check if we can boot from a disk so I have an MS-DOS 6 bootable disk here which has the interlink interserve software on it that we'll be using later to transfer files from this PC and it seems to boot fine. So next up is the MFM hard drive and I really hope that this one will work because I haven't had that much luck with the smaller three and a half inch MFM drives. Now in order to hook this up we need this 20 pin data cable and a 34 pin control cable both coming from the MFM card. On the hard drive we have two connectors and a power connector obviously, so let's hook it up. So we start with the 20 pin data cable that we'll be attaching to the MFM hard drive and then we'll attach the 34 pin control cable. Let's go into the BIOS and configure our hard disk C. Now, in this BIOS we cannot auto detect hard drives but we have different types. Usually you pick the user type and fill in your cylinders but this is a very standard hard drive and it's actually the finest type 2. Type 2 being a hard drive with 615 cylinders, 4 heads and 17 sectors. A very common geometry for 20 megabyte hard drives from that era. And now for the moment of truth. Let's see if it will boot from the hard drive. And it appears to be the case. So we don't hear any strange noises. The hard drive is doing its thing. And it has booted completely into what appears to be some kind of shell, allowing you to launch various programs like this infamous FPROT antivirus program, but also stuff like WordPerfect 5.1. A real blast from the past. In part one, you saw me removing this I.O. card from the PC, the card that contains a serial and parallel port. And this is a card that I'll be needing to transfer files off of this computer because I like to have like a reference on what was originally on the hard drive before I start scratching the hard drive and install new software on it. But when I started the PC, it didn't do anything with the I.O. card attached. So after removing it, I noticed that there was a tantalum capacitor, the one on the right here, that was shorted and that probably caused the PC not to wanting to boot. So when I tried it for the second time, the following happened. Unfortunately, I don't have the original footage anymore, but you can see the aftermath here on this picture. Notice how the capacitor that was short circuit completely exploded. And it also damaged the capacitor next to it, hopefully only superficially, and also the uh, IC just above it. Not to worry, I have this other 8-bit ISA card with a parallel port that came from my IBM 5162. So let's start it up with that one. Ouch, that did not sound good. Let's watch this again. In slow motion perhaps for enhanced dramatic effect. So not only did this computer kill one IO card but it also managed to kill a second one with again a capacitor exploding. So let's look into more detail on what went wrong. So as you can see on this board we have three tantalum capacitors and the middle one just exploded. So let's see if we can find out why these capacitors are used and how they are hooked up to the uh, PCB of this I.O. card. So let's flip it around. And here we can see the three tantalum capacitor where each capacitor has three legs, something that was often used in old IBM computers. Let's get our multimeter and do a continuity check. And I'm going to be using the ISA slot here, which is the B side of the ISA slot. Notice in this picture how the outer pins on the B side are ground pins, B1 and B31. Now, let's take our multimeter and look at the first capacitor. And on this board, the middle pin is the plus pin. So this should point to something on the ISA slot. 
and it's the third pin here which is the 5 volt rail so this is a capacitor which is running off the 5 volt rail let's take a look at another capacitor again we take the middle pin and we can see that it has continuity to pin number 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 pin number 9 being the plus 12 volt rail now onto the capacitor that blew up Notice that the middle pin here has continuity to ground, whereas on the other capacitors, the outer pins have continuity to ground. This is because the capacitor that blew up is uh, hooked up to the minus 12 voltage rail. So in this case, the middle pin of the capacitor uses ground as a reference. And then the outer pins point to the minus 12 volts on the ISA bus, which is pin number 7. Here you can see an overview of all the capacitors and how they are hooked up to the ISA bus. But now on to the million dollar question. Is this some kind of 286 IO killing machine or is there something else at play? I decided to check the minus 12 voltage rail on the power supply. Now the minus 12 volt is only exposed on the power connector that goes into the main board. So I've added a piece of wire here and I've stuck it into this minus 12 volt pin and then I checked it using the multimeter. And it is in fact outputting minus 12 volts, 11.5 to be exact. The other voltages were also okay as we already checked before. So we have the 5 volts and the 12 volts, which check out OK. So was it just my luck that I had two I.O. cards with two failing capacitors at the same time? So let's find out. So I'm going to be removing these blown capacitors. First, I'm going to be using the IBM card here. So I'm just going to remove this tantalum capacitor and I'm going to replace it with a new one. Again, notice how when we do a continuity test, and I'm using the housing here as a ground reference, that it actually points to the plus pin of the blown capacitor. Again, because the capacitor is on the negative 12 volt rail. I'm going to be replacing this with this 10 microfarad 35 volt capacitor. Now this is a two pin capacitor that I'm going to be placing in this three pin area on the PCB. Because of the fact that the outer pins are the minus and the center pin is the plus, you just need to check the polarity of this capacitor and you can put it in like this without any problems. Onto the other card where the capacitor was even more destroyed, took a little bit of effort to get it out. So I'm going to be using my desoldering pump to clear up the pins. And notice here as we do a continuity test on the capacitor that it's again the minus 12 volt rail which was impacted. And as with the IBM adapter here, the housing or ground of the card corresponds to the plus pin of this capacitor. We're going to be replacing the broken capacitor with the same 10 microfarad 35 volt capacitor. This is a two pin uh, assignment on the PCB. So we just need to look at the polarity again, making sure that the marking, which corresponds to the plus sign, goes into the correct hole of the PCB. Just add some solder and we should be good to go. So let's plug it into the computer, find some cover and turn the machine on and see what it does. And lo and behold, it starts up just fine. So in the end, this was just a failing capacitor on the IO card and the exact same thing happened on the IBM card. Now I wanted to use this IO card because I wanted to transfer the files from this hard drive onto another one. So I'm going to be using InterServe Interlink and here I'm going to be using my Intel Celeron PC, which is a bit more modern to connect to the old 286. So here we see three new drive letters available on our Celeron PC that correspond to the drive letters on the 286 computer. So now I have an F drive that corresponds to the C drive on the 286. So I should have an F drive here which now points to the hard drive of the 286 and I'm going to be using Norton Commander to copy over all of the files. Taking about 15 minutes to complete. 
And when that's done, we can safely try to install MS-DOS 5.0 on this machine. So that will involve formatting the drive again, which I can now safely do as I have a backup of all the original files which were on there. So I'm just going to do a format C slash S, which will also transfer the system files from the MS-DOS disk onto this hard drive. But I did notice while it was formatting that it did try to recover some allocation units. So this is usually not a very good sign. So there will be some bad sectors probably on this hard drive. So again, at around 60%, it did the same. So hopefully there aren't going to be too many bad sectors. And so we ended up with 61K of bad sectors. Now, I don't know if a low level format of this hard drive would help in this case. Uh, perhaps I'll try that in part three. But for now, I'm just gonna go ahead and install MS-DOS version 5.0 so that I can load up some additional software on this machine and start with a totally blank hard drive. So now with MS-DOS installed, the computer is starting up just fine. Both floppy drives working just fine. And more importantly, the fact that we have a fully functioning hard drive able to boot into DOS. We've made some great progress, but I still want to look into some changes in part three where I'll be looking for another monitor. Adding some network connectivity to the PC so that I can hook it up to my local area network. Add a sound card for some multimedia. And some speakers, of course. So I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider subscribing, liking, sharing, commenting. Be sure to be on the lookout for part three, which should come out relatively soon. And take care. Bye-bye.